Um, well, for those who have joined, I'm, I'm um, really honored and excited to be able to introduce Lorenzo Azzolini. Um, Dr. Azzolini joined our interventional cardiology group last August, so has been at University of Washington just short of a year. Uh, we stole him away from Virginia Commonwealth University, where he had been on faculty for a few years uh, prior and leading their uh, complex coronary efforts there. Um, before that, he's had an incredibly uh, diverse and uh, rich cultural training and educational experience at, in New York City, Montreal, Barcelona, San Rafael, uh, Italy. Um, He's been incredibly prolific as a publisher with over 160 uh, publications and 19 book chapters, and uh, hence uh, our recruitment of him to be a director of interventional cardiology research, among other uh, roles and responsibilities. So we're really excited uh, that Lorenzo has joined us and um, uh, look forward to hearing this, this um, lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie for uh, the introduction and uh, thanks to the division for allowing me uh, to present on this uh, topic that is very dear to me. Chronic total occlusion percutaneous coronary intervention has represented my um, both my clinical and research focus uh, uh, for many years now. So early on after the inception of PCI almost 50 years ago, chronic total occlusions were recognized as the most challenging lesion subset for interventional cardiologists and have sparked uh, intense debate bo both under the technical point of view uh, and particularly on the indication of revascularization, which is what we're going to discuss today. So I'm going to share with you um, a remarkable uh, interview with Andreas Stronzik, a luminary who first developed PCI in 1977. So this interview was given in 1984, 39 years ago, just one year before his tragic death. So uh, I think the video will be a bit um, jumpy, but the audio should come across just fine. I like to depart on more total closures and try to learn how to deal with total closures. We did a study on that and we found out that 70% of the patients who are rejected for dilatation had been patients with total closures in one or the other artery while having more disease in the others. Therefore, the total closure is a real problem. We cannot solve the total closure problem. We probably will never really address the question of multivessel disease dilatation. So this gives us an idea of the struggle that ever since the introduction of PCI, interventional cardiologists had to go through when facing uh, chronic total occlusion, or as the Dr. Grunzik called them, total closures. So, <clears throat> CDO are indeed a common encounter in our cath labs. You can see uh, here that although with some variability, the prevalence is pretty high, on average 20 to 25 percent. And if we consider patients with previous cabbage, uh, CDOs are actually found in most cases, in most studies, in, now, in nine out of 10 patients. How do uh, CTO originate? Well, they can originate uh, basically in two ways. A progressive stenosis, so a more chronic uh, evolution of a long-standing uh, uh, coronary artery disease, or an acute thrombosis, which, however, does not manifest uh, itself clinically in such a way to be promptly diagnosed as an MI, and then witnesses the remodeling of the thrombotic material into a more uh, fibrocalcified structure. So this second group of patients might recall feeling unwell on a specific day for a few hours. They did not immediately seek medical care, then they felt better. So in some cases, actually patients with CMR evidence of an all infarction do not recall any of these symptoms. And on the other hand, 50%, only 50% of CTO patients have a Q ways in the corresponding EKG territory. So there is still really a lot to be learned about the pathophysiology of CTOs. And finally, CTOs can affect native arteries or uh, stented segments alike. So they can also be the uh, result of instant uh, occlusive restenosis. What is the clinical presentation of patients with CTO? So most patients refer either angina or dyspnea as an anginal equivalent. 
it seems that the dyspnea is somewhat more frequent in patients with CTOs than uh, those with non-occlusive disease, both in men and women. Um, so some patients report fatigue, lack of energy, or simply that they're not able to do what they were uh, used to do just a few months or years earlier. Importantly, a non-trivial share of uh, CDO patients have refractory angina, despite being on treatment with three or more agents. Very provocative data. Up to one-fourth of patients with CTO screen positive for major depression, and this is assessed using validated questionnaires. And these are usually those who suffer the most severe angina. Patients who want angina is so severe that it compromises almost every aspect of their uh, daily life. Um, of note, 3% of patients with CTOs can present with sudden death due to ventricular tachycardia fibrillation, and 17% uh, uh, have an LVF of less than 30%, which brings uh, CTOs at the intersection with arrhythmias and heart failure management. More information about CTOs. 50% of CTO patients actually have two or three CTOs, and a similar percentage has CTO due to instant restenosis. Uh, more than half of CDO patients have three vessel uh, CAD, which again brings us uh, back to the Andreas Grunzig interview. And finally, if we just focus on cabbage patient, uh, including CTOs that were already present before cabbage and those that develop in the 12 months after cabbage, almost 90% have a CTO by year one post cabbage. And unfortunately, in almost 8% of patients, both the native artery and the graft that was meant to revascularize that territory are occluded. So we've seen that CTOs have a pretty relevant disease burden, but what are the benefits of CTO recanalization? So these are all mediated by improvement in perfusion of this ischemic territory. So we're going to review each um, uh, each one of these uh, mechanisms. So lower incidence of ventricular arrhythmia, improvement in LV function, the interesting concept of double jeopardy, and most importantly, the relief of angina, improvement of physical function and quality of life. Seminal studies from two decades ago indicated that if we cross a CTO uh, and we pressure wire it, so we interrogate with a physiology wire in the distal vessel, the result, excuse me, will invariably be ischemic with an FFR of uh, less than 0.80. So the myocardial area that depends on a CTO vessel is invariably ischemic, regardless of the degree of collateralization. And we know from the uh, FAIN trials that revascularizing uh, lesions with a positive FFR is associated with better clinical outcomes. So uh, why should it be uh, any different for CTOs? We know from a PET and CMR studies that the vast majority, actually nine patients out of 10, have uh, ischemia and or viability in the myocardial territory that is um, subtended by the CTO. And they enjoy improvement in myocardial blood flow and reduction of ischemic burden after successful recanalization. Transmural infarction, as seen on CMR, affects only a very small uh, area of the myocardium, usually just around 5%. Um, so this is probably due to the presence of collaterals. Well-developed collaterals are in fact associated with less myocardial scar and more preserved function. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that even in the presence of scan collateralization, as you can see here, viability is present in over 90% of cases. Indeed, we recently demonstrated with a comprehensive CMR protocol involving both gadolinium and dobutamine-based viability assessment that collateral extent is not correlated to segmental function or scar transmurality uh, and hence viability. And unless, as you can see here, more than 75% of myocardial thickness lights up on gadolinium assessment, viability is present in, more, in most cases, even with more uh, around 75% of myocardial thickness, you have uh, already more than 70% of probability of uh, viability of that territory. Let's now switch gears and focus on the arrhythmogenic potential of CTOs. There has been some thought-provoking research on this topic, and it is pretty established that patients with a CTO suffer higher incidence of appropriate ICD shocks and ventricular tachycardia recurrence after ablation compared with patients with no CTO. Although these arrhythmias are thought to be mostly related to scar tissue in the myocardial area subtended by the CTO, there is anecdotal evidence suggesting that CTO can also cause ventricular arrhythmias mediated by ischemia, 
such as in this uh, case report where ventricular tachycardia could be related to uh, myocardial ischemia due to um, an RCA CTO. And after recanalizing the CTO, the patient did not suffer any more episode of ventricular tachycardia on long-term follow-up of his um, ICD. And in this unique study, the authors uh, perform electroanatomical mapping before and immediately after CTO PCI in three patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy and recurrence carmediated VT. They found that CTO PCI substantially reduced low voltage aerial scars. And in the two patients with follow up um, electroanatomical mapping, it, show, it showed a reduction in the overall scar area. So really thought-provoking data on the arrhythmogenic potential of CTOs. Regarding the effects of CTO recanalization on LV remodeling, main, uh, many, mainly observational studies have been conducted, which are summarized by this meta-analysis. So CTO recanalization can promote favorable remodeling with decrease in LV uh, diameters and improvement in LV function. In more recent, uh, uh, exclusively CMR-based studies, the improvement of uh, left ventricle ejection fraction in the overall population was modest, about 2.6%. But if we just focus on patients with uh, left ventricle dysfunction defined as an LVF of less than 45%, this improvement was higher, approximately 5.5%. The concept of double jeopardy is very interesting, uh, I believe, because patients suffering with, um, uh, with patients with CTO actually suffering from acute MI have also higher uh, adjusted risk of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and this can be traced uh, to the concept of double jeopardy. So, if we don't have a CTO, the MI is only going to cause problems in the myocardial area subtended by the acute uh, occluded vessel. However, if you also have a CTO that is collateralized by this um, donor vessel that then occludes acutely, we're going to suffer a much larger MI with subsequently high risk of malignant arrhythmias and cardiogenic shock. And finally, uh, let's focus on the area of a CTO research where there is most evidence and mechanistic data. There is ample data showing that successful CTO PCI improves quality of life as assessed with validated questionnaire, in this case the SF36, and objective tests. And this is mediated, um, so also objective tests such as the walk distance, and this is mediated by the improvement in the ischemic burden as assessed with CMR in this study. In the introduction, I hinted at the fact that CTO patients have an unusually high rate of positive screening for major depression, 23%, with 6% being on antidepressant. In fact, disease, um, depressed patients seem to suffer more from angina and dyspnea, uh, like uh, compared to their non-depressed counterpart. And CTO recanalization provides a more pronounced benefit in terms of quality of life in depressed patients. So in other words, what happens is that very uh, severe limitation of quality of life due to the presence of a CTO is associated with reactive depression because the patient can get to enjoy life at the most basic level. So if we are able to revascularize this patient, they're going to derive great symptomatic benefit. Despite the high prevalence, only a small proportion of CTOs are actually recanalized. And actually CTO PCI represent only five to 15% on average um, of overall cath lab volumes. And why do we think is that? So what is happening here is similar to the Aesop fable of the fox and the grapes. So the fox spots some high-hanging grapes and desires to reach them, but is unable to do so. And then she rationalizes the lack of success, saying that after all, they were not that tasty and worth going after. So she is rationalizing her lack of success. And I think that something similar is happening with CTO PCI. Since it's a challenging procedure requiring a dedicated skill set and its outcome are suboptimal in non-dedicated operator's hand, the same people who can do it say it's pointless to do it. And indeed, CTO PCI is associated with considerable rate of complication, mainly perforation and tamponade, but also death at a slightly higher rate than uh, all comers undergoing PCI. And this has consistently been reproduced in several courts. The rates of complication of CTO PCI are higher compared to both uh, all comers undergoing PCI, and this is data from NCDR, CAT PCI registry, and PCI for complex non CTO lesions. So let's pause now for a second and uh, uh, 
pose a provocative question. So if PCI of CT is associated with high risk for complications, perhaps medical therapy should be the way to go. Well, this is not the case, and I'm going to share with you a few studies on this topic. The first one is a large Canadian registry that followed patients with CTOs managed medically, the blue line here, versus uh, those uh, who received revascularization either with cabbage or PCI. Medically managed patients suffer higher rates of mortality on 10 years follow-up, and the superior outcome seen with revascularization extended to both uh, PCI and cabbage on adjusted analysis. Classic fallacy in the uh, CTO space, which we unfortunately keep hearing over and over again, is that well-collateralized CTOs are a benign entity and medical management is enough in these cases. And so this uh, South Korean study included only patients with well-developed collaterals and found that revascularization is associated with better survival and survival free of MACE, even after adjusting uh, using sophisticated statistical methods. This is the open CTO study, uh, a prospective and methodologically very rigorous registry that included uh, a thousand consecutive patients undergoing CTO PCI performed by experienced operators in the US. I'm going to be talking more about these studies later in the presentation. But in this part, I want just to uh, focus on the fact that 15% of patients refer for CTO PCI suffer from angina that is refractory to three or more antianginals. And as you can see here, PCI is associated with marked improvement in quality uh, of life and angina, as assessed with a validated questionnaire, the SAQ or Seattle Angina Questionnaire. And on average, more than 30 points uh, is the improvement. And let's note that at least 10 points is already uh, considered clinically meaningful improvement for these patients. So really a large, very large benefit seen in these very symptomatic and optimally uh, medically managed patients. More data from OpenCTO. <clears throat> Anti-angel medication de-escalation is possible in 39% of patients after CTO-PCI. And this is more likely if we achieve complete revascularization. So with CTO-PCI, we're able to make life easier for our patients who have to take less medication with subsequent benefits in terms of side effects and saving both for the patient and for the healthcare system. As a consequence of the increased scrutiny on CTO-PCI due to lower success rates and higher rates of complication, CTO-PCI is performed for more appropriate indications compared to PCI for non-occlusive lesions. And less than 1% of cases, and this is again data from uh, OpenCTO, are considered to have a rarely appropriate indication. These findings have been uh, replicated with data both from the Japanese healthcare system and the US. So it is consistent across the board. Uh, now, a few words about the durability of uh, CTO PCI. So, indeed, CTO PCI is associated with longer stented segment, higher CAD and comorbidity burden. So, the results are uh, a little bit um, less encouraging compared to uh, PCI for all commerce lesion. And uh, we have MACE rate of about 10% at one year, that increased to 20 to 25% at three years, with most events due to TVR. So in this context, since medical management is not enough and PCI is not devoid of risks and not always successful, and the long-term uh, outcomes are good, but uh, not excellent compared to all commerce, what about surgery? It is unquestionable that the outcomes of internal mammary artery-based surgical revascularizations are very, very solid and perhaps even better on the long term than those of PCI with contemporary stents. However, complete anterior revascularization can only be offered in selected cases and by a very small minority of surgical programs uh, either in the U.S. or around the world. And we can see, uh, for, we know from many publications that uh, the outcomes of SVG-based revascularization are comparable to what we were using 20 years ago in PCI, so bare metal stents with higher risk stenosis rate uh, already in the first year, but extending all the way uh, to uh, five and 10 years. The reality is, and this is data from the Syntax trial, is that in one third of cases in the cabbage arm, the CTO vessel is not grafted and having a CTO is as the strongest independent predictor of not achieving complete revascularization. 
This is data from a trial. It's called RAS trial. They randomized patients to um, SVG versus radial artery as a secondary graft to known LED territories. So between the patient that already had a CTO before surgery and those who developed it in the first year after cabbage, 86% had at least one CTO a year after cabbage. And unfortunately, as we discussed earlier, in 7.5% of cases, an occlusion of both the native coronary artery and the graft uh, meant to uh, revascularize that territory was observed. So cabbage is a valuable tool, valuable option for multivessel CD patients, but the outcomes of known IMA graft are not necessarily better than those of contemporary stents. And since cabbage accelerates native artery atherosclerosis, we often face a much tougher clinical scenarios a few years down the road if both the native and its graft have occluded. Perhaps the guidelines can help us and guide our decision making. Neither the European nor the very recent US guidelines give strong indication in favor or even against CTOPCI, unfortunately. Both give a class two recommendation and a level uh, B level of evidence. And uh, while the European guidelines recommend considering CTOPCI in patients with refractory angina or high ischemic burden, the recent US guidelines consider the benefit of CTOPCI as uncertain. And this has sparked intense debate in the community in light of the rather convincing data that I showed before and then I'm going to share in the next few minutes. So if we consider CTO simply as another lesion in the context of multivessel PCI, we are referred to the syntax trial and the syntax score. The syntax score was derived more than 20 years ago and heavily penalizes um, CTOs. So uh, while um, a non occlusive lesion has a 2x uh, score multiplier, CTO sc uh, scores um, uh, 5x, as you can see here. So a simple proximal LED CTO with no feature of complexity already gives us 18.5 points, which is very close to the threshold of 23, beyond which PCI is considered um, not recommended by guidelines. And why, while these um, might have made sense 20 years ago, when only few experienced operators were able to successfully treat CTOs, and both the techniques and technology utilized were not very advanced, this is certainly not the case anymore nowadays. So our specialty has come a long way and we're going to discuss about the technical aspect of CTO-PCI in a few minutes. Let's now have a systematic look at the registry and trial data. I'm going to just mention the most uh, rigorous and, uh, and larger studies in the interest of time. So the EXPLORE trial um, was an interesting trial that evaluated whether, uh, whether opening uh, a CTO within a week after a STEMI treated with primary PCI on another vessel was beneficial in promoting LV function recovery compared to medical therapy alone. A four month follow up CMR, there were no differences in LVF and remodeling parameters between CTO, PCI, and medical therapy, but we're going to talk more about this study in a few moments. The controversial decision CTO trial showed no benefits in long term hard clinical outcomes between CTO, PCI, and medical therapy. However, the trial was limited by very many by, uh, limitations, very slow enrollment. For example, places that were uh, routinely performing 20, 25 CTO PCIs a month were just including uh, two or three patients a month. Uh, the initial sample size, I think, was 1,800 patients, and they only ended up with 800 patients uh, due to slow enrollment. There was a significant crossover, 18%, from the medical therapy arm to the CTO PCI arm. And also the biggest limit, one of the biggest limitations that the fact that CTO, that PCI of non-CTO lesions was allowed in both study arms, so also in the medical therapy arm. And actually half of the control population received PCI of those lesions. So this is basically a trial of multivessel PCI of all lesions, but the CTO versus multivessel PCI of, of also the CTO uh, lesions. So a poorly designed and executed study. We already discussed about open CTO. So briefly, it's a rigorous observational study that included a thousand consecutive patients undergo CTO PCI by experienced uh, UVS operators using a validated algorithm that I'm going to discuss more in detail in the next few minutes. So consecutive enrollment here was ensured against the NCDR CAT PCI registry data to avoid selection bias, so-called cherry picking. And clinical outcomes were favorable with 7% of MACE in hospital MACE and a very marked improvement in angina frequency, physical limitation, 
quality of life, dyspnea, and also symptom of depression, as we just discussed, as assessed with validated questionnaires. And again, 99.5% of procedure were either appropriate, maybe appropriate or um, unmappable according to AUC criteria. Only 0.5 were deemed really appropriate. This improvement in quality of life seen in open CTO were also confirmed by the Euro CTO trial, with which appropriately randomized patients to either CTO PCI or medical therapy only after treating the non CTO lesion. So we have very strong and methodologically solid data supporting the role of CTO PCI in improving symptoms and quality of life. This table summarizes what we just discussed. The open CTO registry in the Euro CTO trial showed a significant improvement in quality of life. Explorer was underpowered for clinical outcomes, had low success rate, and almost one fourth of patients crossed over from the medical therapy to the CTO PCI arm. And decision CTO was plagued by a large selection bias, crossover, uh, enrollment was terminated prematurely, and PCI of non occlusive lesion was wrongly allowed after randomization to either R. What is next for CTO PCI research? Well, the ischemia CTO trial is a large randomized controlled trial that is uh, enrolling currently. The projected uh, sample size is 1,500 patients, and it's evaluating the role of CTO PCI in improving heart clinical outcomes in asymptomatic patients with large ischemic burden and quality of life in symptomatic patients with lower ischemic burden. Its results are expected no earlier than 2028, so we will have to wait at least another five years. I know I'm now going to try to uh, put all this information together to provide you with some practical recommendation on how to approach CTO patient in clinical practice. So first, we should evaluate if the patient is symptomatic with either angina or dyspnea or fatigue. If that is the case, we have a look at the echocardiogram. If wall motion is normal or there is at most hypokinesia of the CTO territory, viability is most likely present and CTO revascularization is indicated. In case of akinesia or dyskinesia, we have to demonstrate viability to make an argument in favor of CTO recanalization. Otherwise, uh, medical therapy will be appropriate and indicated. In asymptomatic patients, revascularization is indicated in case of significant ischemic burden. So I want to share this review that we published a few years ago. We provided for the first time an integrated approach to CTO revascularization from both the interventional cardiologists and the cardiac surgeon's uh, point of view. Basically, in case revascularization is indicated, we should first consider if the patient had had prior cabbage. So if this is the case, <clears throat> BCI will most likely be the preferred revascularization modality unless the LED territory also requires revascularization, in which case we will favor cabbage. In cabbage naive subjects, PCI will be the choice for one vessel CAD and non complex um, multi vessel uh, uh, CAD. In case of multi vessel CAD with Sinta score greater than 32, cabbage or hybrid revascularization will be indicated. And of note, multiple to or total arterial revascularization should be sought in case cabbage is pursued. Importantly, local expertise, both on the interventional cardiology and on the cardiothoracic surgery side, will also play a role in the decision making. But under no circumstances, we should deny the optimal revascularization modality to our patients because we are not able to do a certain procedure. In such cases, we should refer our patients to more experienced interventionalists or surgeons. Regardless of the modality, cabbage versus PCI, uh, our goal should be to achieve complete revascularization as incomplete revascularization has been associated with the worst outcomes, including mortality, both uh, in cabbage and PCI treated subjects. And this has also been um, demonstrated in patients undergoing CTO PCI where the best maze free rates are actually achieved by patient receiving complete revascularization. CTO PCI nowadays achieves success rate uh, in the order of 90% in the hands of experienced operator. And this, uh, its long-term outcomes are similar to those of non-occlusive complex PCI. In the last part of my talk, I'm going to give you some technical information uh, <clears throat> to help you understand how we systematically approach these lesions in the cath lab. Basically, we can cross the CTOs either antigradely or retrogradely, and either with the intraplaque or true to true lumen uh, approach, or using dissection and reentry uh, crossing strategy. So we dissect the vessel uh, along the CTOs and, and then we reenter. So 
This gives us four possible crossing strategies. So uh, the dominant set of procedural technique with which CTO uh, are tackling the cath lab nowadays is actually uh, the hybrid algorithm, which was developed over a decade ago when our colleague Bill Lombardi invited a dozen of uh, early CTO enthusiasts operator to his hospital in Bellingham. And together they devised a systematic and easy to implement angiographic analysis to guide the procedural decision making. This hybrid algorithm spread quickly uh, from North America to Europe and South America and is based on a fluid transition across three different crossing strategies, anti-grid wiring, anti-grid dissection re-entry, and the retrograde approach. And the effort here is to minimize further attempts in a uh, failure mode and instead favor switching to another approach which has higher likelihood of success, thus promoting procedural efficiency. This is the hybrid algorithm in which we analyze mainly four characteristics. Um, so if the proximal cap is ambiguous, if the distal vessel is of poor quality and or interventional collateral exists, so collaterals that we can navigate uh, with a wire microcatheter to recanalize the vessel. So if these uh, one or more of these uh, <clears throat> uh, questions has a positive answer, we would favor a retrograde approach. If those characteristics are not present, we would prefer anti-grid techniques, further refining our decision-making based on the occlusion length. If that is shorter than 20 millimeter, we would try to use anti-grid wiring techniques. We intend to maintain a true-to-true -true lumen approach because this is likely to be successful in short occlusions. While if the CTO is longer than 20 millimeter, we would favor anti-grid dissection re-entry because the likelihood that a true-to-true -true lumen approach in these cases is successful is quite low. So we want to maximize procedural efficiency, safely navigate the occlusion in subintimal space, and then achieve re-entry. In the coming years after the Bellingham meeting, new co global consensus documents were published, further providing systematic recommendation on how to tackle these complex lesions. So among other things, Particular emphasis was put on a structured analysis of the angiogram obtained with dual angiography, so injecting both the CTO vessel and the collateral donor vessel, as well as on the use of dedicated materials such as microcatheters and wires, and on the importance of adequate lesion preparation and intravascular imaging to guide the procedure. And importantly, these documents uh, stress the importance of achieving and maintaining adequate expertise by ensuring high case volumes and also having specialized equipment available. So I'm now going to share three simple examples where we apply this hybrid algorithm and show you uh, what goes on in our heads when we plan and execute the procedure. This is a very carefully planned procedure. We're not just going and improvise. So this is a short mid LAD chronic total occlusion with an ambiguous proximal cap. You can see that the vessel is abruptly interrupted at the level of the diagonal. The distal vessel is of good quality and there are some uh, challenging um, uh, epicardial collaterals uh, from the uh, circumflex. So this is the application of the hybrid algorithm in this case. There is an ambiguous proximal cap, the distal vessel is not of poor quality, and there are interventional collaterals, uh, better said, collaterals that can be considered interventional for some uh, operators, but still uh, epicardial collaterals are associated with higher risk of complication. So since the lesion length was less than 20 millimeter, we initially favor an anti-grade wiring approach. And actually we were able to quickly and safely recanalize the vessel, achieving a very good result. So this is another case with a long CTO of the mid-RCA with a proximal cap that is tapered, is known ambiguous. Uh, the distal vessel is of good quality, but the occlusion is very, very long, um, much more than 20 millimeters, and there are tortuous non-interventional collaterals. So no proximal cap ambiguity, no poor distal target, no appropriate in, uh, interventional collaterals. The lesion is longer than 20 millimeters, so we favor an anterior dissection re-entry technique. And so um, we go with a dedicated device, in this case, the crossbus device, then re-entry was easily achieved with a dedicated uh, stingray balloon, thus achieving a good final result. And finally, this third case is another mid rca CTO that has, however, an ambiguous proximal cap with a side branch at the proximal cap, ambiguous also distal cap here, long occlusion more than 20. And there are some collaterals from the left side. They are epicardial, so this is to be kept into consideration. So in theory, um, we should have gone directly for a retrograde approach here because all the answers are yes here, 
but since that there was some uh, um, reluctance at using these uh, uh, epicardiac collaterals from the left side, we initially went for a, an anti approach. This proved to be unsuccessful, and very quickly we switched to a retrograde approach where we were, we were able to safely and easily cross the occlusion and then achieve a very good final result. Multiple studies have shown that the hybrid algorithm can easily be taught, is safe, eff effective, and efficient, and allows to tackle complex occlusion that previously had lower likelihood of success with conventional techniques. And in fact, not adhering to the hybrid algorithm in this interesting study has been identified as an independent predictor of technical failure. Achieving good results, however, requires significant effort and commitment by the operators and their institutions. So considering that more than 50% of US operators have success rate that are lower than 60% when tackling CTOs, improvement uh, in success and complication rates can be seen when we start doing at least that but better 20 or more of such occlusion on a yearly basis. But if we really want to get very good at it and achieve this uh, holy grail at 90%, we do need to have a very busy practice with 100 or more cases a year. And this of course requires exclusive dedication to CTO practice by the operators, um, a desire to learn, um, uh, the best practices, but not only the operator, but also the, the, the team uh, in the cath lab. Crucially, the support of colleagues, uh, the cath lab and the division leadership, as well as the administration. So the era where uh, there were these jack of all trades intervention is able to tackle a CTO and then expect to do uh, mitrically, for example, and then a complex below the knee intervention, peripheral intervention is, uh, is basically over the every one of these fields has become so specialized that we really need in the case of CTO to just focus on those, go to the dedicated CTO meetings, interact with a uh, um, like-minded peer, uh, read books, read uh, articles, the literature. It's really a full-time uh, commitment exclusively to CTO PCI. So I now want to share with you a case from our practice. This was a challenging 51-year-old man, uh, status post cabbage and very many catheterization with over a dozen stents implanted after cabbage. So on catheterization, he was found to have his two uh, SVGs to the OM and RCA occluded, and the lima was patent, and all the natives were occluded, particularly the circumflex and especially the RCA. He was on optimal medical therapy with maximal doses of three agents, and he had severe inferior ischemia on CMR that also showed a mildly depressed LD function. The patient really suffered from very, very severe angina and dyspnea stress, requiring half a dozen sublingual nitroglycerin tablets a day. He scored very poorly on quality of life questionnaire, and he was referred uh, to us for cardiac transplant evaluation and had actually been told that no further revascularization option was possible. And this is uh, unfortunately the typical story of the majority of our patients. They are told that nothing can be done, but guess what? It can be done in most cases in the experienced operator's hand. So this is the RCA. It's indeed a very complex occlusion. It's long, tortuous. It starts probably here in the mid to distal segment. There is a um, multi there are multiple features of occlusion complexity, uh, ambiguous course calcification, bending, long length. And this is the Lima 2LED that is patent that also shows some septal collaterals that give uh, scant collateralization to the RCA territory, to the RPDA. So we initially tried an integrate approach, but uh, we were unfortunately uh, and not unexpectedly subintimal at the crux. As you, I will pause this for a second and you can see here that the PDA or the wire is trying to enter is being compressed by a subintial and hematoma and the likelihood of being able to rescue both the um, uh, PDA and the PLB is pretty low with, uh, with this approach. So uh, we quickly switched to a retrograde approach. We navigate the Lima LED, we put a microcatheter in the septal and with a microcatheter and a wire, we're able to quickly reach the, um, as you can see here, the RPDA we face, uh, we overcame some resistance advancing our retrograde gear through the calcified distal RCA. We advanced here on knuckle wire and we were able to eventually make the connection in the proximal RCA and, our, and advance our retrograde gear into the anterior guide catheter. From now on, it's just standard PCI, pre dilatation based on IVUS, <coughs> stenting, and post dilatation. And this is 
the optimal final result that we achieved, slight pinching of this branch that was probably compromised with integrated approach, but overall very good result with a very good flow. But what really matters is what I'm going to share next. So the patient was discharged and eventually the next day. But the most striking thing that is that the patient immediately told us that he felt like a new person. He did not experience his usual engine at night. He did not need his usual sublingual nitroglycerin anymore. He became asymptomatic and follow-up CMR showed complete revascularization, uh, complete resolution of his inferior ischemia. So this story is indeed remarkable and cases like this one motivate us to work hard and improve a little every day to provide better outcomes for our patients. Because our patients do not care if their CTOs and CAD in general is easy or hard to treat, the only thing that matters to them is that we are able to provide them with complete revascularization and symptomatic benefit, which will allow them to feel better. So uh, I'm going to wrap up here to give some space for questions, but in summary, CTOs are fre frequently found in the cath lab, but they are uh, often left untreated due to lack of expertise of knowledge or knowledge. CTOs markedly differ from non occlusive lesion with regard to pathophysiology, clinical manifestation, and technical and technological aspects related to their recanalization. There are strong pathophysiological bases supporting CTO revascularization, improvement in quality of life, physical function, and angina, reduction of ischemia, decreasing the arrhythmic burden, improvement in LV function. It does not necessarily matter if we revascularize CTOs with a state-of-the-art imaging-based PCI using validated algorithm or cabbage. What truly matters is that we achieve complete revascularization for our patients. And an algorithmic approach to CTO PCI can optimize procedure success rate and efficiency while minimizing at the same time complication. And I want to thank you for your attention and I will be now happy to take any question you have. Lorenzo, that was terrific. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. And I, I'm sure questions will pop up here, um, but I, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, you showed a, a ton of data, and I guess I have a question for you it is if money wasn't an issue and there was funding, um, what what is the trial or what's the next thing that you would organize to really sort of settle the settle the issue or clarify some of the um lingering questions or lingering doubts what how would you how do you design things or what question would you try to answer yeah of course this is a very relevant topic so uh basically uh, <clears throat> so the answer uh the question that if cto pci is able to provide symptomatic benefits has already been answered and there's compelling data under this point of view so what the guidelines um uh, committee focus more when drafting that uncertain recommendation uh, of about the benefit of CTO PCI was the decision CTO trial that, as mentioned, was a poorly designed trial. So, I think that the next big trial in the CTO space should be a trial aimed at showing uh, some kind of improvement in heart clinical endpoints. But at the same time, it's challenging because in most cases, uh, unless we're considering uh, left main and, par and possibly proximal LED or primary PCI, it's very hard to expect that PCI of a CD or any other lesion can extend a life expectancy and survival. So um, it's a challenging question. For sure, the uh, heart clinical outbound, uh, uh, outcomes in this trial should not be exclusive mortality, cardiac mortality. It should also include some kind of uh, um, MI, target vascular, target vascular revascularization, and uh, a readmission of, uh, for angina. And I would also include <clears throat> some evaluation of the healthcare costs associated with not treating the uh the cto and uh, with with a pci or revascularization in general and managing it medically so part uh, of the answer to this question hopefully will be provided by the ischemia cto trial but i think we will have to wait uh maybe until the next decade to see um the results and uh, so it's uh, it's it's not easy but i think that the goal should be to demonstrate improvement in heart clinical endpoints and also as a secondary analysis, uh, cost effectiveness of a decreased, uh, demonstrated that CTO-PCI is able to decrease 
the financial burden for the healthcare and the patient, and the number of, uh, of medication administered and the side effects. Perfect, thank you. Uh, there are some questions that have come up through the chat, so maybe I can, I'll just uh, read those for the group. So Kate Carney uh, says, the data surrounding viability as a predictor of improvement with revascularization is increasingly confusing. Do you think this is a modality specific or are other clinical factors to explain this? And how do you reconcile this to apply it, uh, to apply its use in clinical practice? Yeah, so, there has been a recent, uh, uh, I think Kate is referring to the recent uh, sub-analysis or revise, uh, revive BCIS-2 trial that focused, that, so basically the trial uh, included patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy on LVF or less than 35% and multivessel disease uh, and randomized patient to medical therapy or PCI. And uh, there were no differences in the heart clinical endpoint of death and uh, admission for heart failure. And the secondary analysis was uh, also the improvement of LVF. So in this some analysis, surprisingly, but actually confirming the uh, findings of the STITCH trial, uh, viability assessment was not um, found to be uh, useful uh, to guide the decision making. So basically, uh, there was this long-standing concept that uh, hibernating uh, myocardium, uh, myocardium is akinetic, um, but then derives significant improvement uh, after revascularization uh, can play a role in, uh, in the management of these patients. So it was shown that only myocardium that was uh, clearly viable, uh, the, you know, uh, with a, uh, the CMR, 78%, I think, in this study underwent CMR, um, uh, was not a predictor of improved outcomes or improvement of LDF uh, on follow-up. And the only predictor was found to be uh, the generally like uh, normally looking myocardium. And uh, on the other hand, the opposite, the extent of scar area. So um, the criticism that was moved against Stitch was that uh, all modalities such as thallium, were used in most cases to evaluate uh, viability or stress echocardiogram that can be in some cases operator dependent. But in this revived uh, BCS2 trial, actually, I think the three quarters of patients underwent CMR. So really, um, this poses some, some, some doubts about the role of viability assessment uh, with uh, more sophisticated methods. Uh, we usually, uh, many institutions use CMR and we have seen that, however, uh, if we just focus on uh, gadolinium enhancement, up to 75% of the thickness of the myocardium, even if it's, uh, uh, it lights up on a gadolinium assessment, uh, there is viability in most cases. So uh, this really, uh, you know, uh, shatters our conviction about uh, the role of uh, viability evaluation in, uh, in, uh, um, in these patients. And I think we would be uh, more drawn towards uh, evaluating the patient under the clinical point of view. And unless the risk of the specific CTOPCI in that specific case is prohibitive, and if we are uh, doubtful whether or not to proceed, maybe it's worth being more proactive because we've seen that even cases uh, that had uh, um, extensive scar burden, both on CMR and also used, as you can see in the arrhythmia, uh, the arrhythmia models that I, uh, that I showed earlier during the presentation, these uh, so-called scar tissue actually regresses during, <clears throat> during follow-up. So it's uh, surely uh, a tough, a tough uh, uh, topic to, and that there's a further research. Yeah, I think Jake Dole also had a similar question, right? Yeah. Um, the observational data regarding viability scheme and clinical benefit are impressive, but the same could have been said about open artery PCI for stable CAD prior to courage scheme and revive. Do you think that CTO PCI may provide more benefit than non CTO PCI for stable CAD, or should we consider them equivalent? Related, what do you counsel your patient about the likelihood of patient of benefit of CTO PCI? So there is a lot packed into this question, and um, so. Um, I firmly believe that CTOPCI does provide a uh, symptomatic benefit, and this is at the moment the most established uh, indication. So when we approach the conversation with, uh, with the patients, uh, uh, I always tell them this is the main goal. Um, 
the uh, symptomatic improvement. There is no data supporting the role of PCI or CTO PCI for that matter um, um, on extending uh, survival at the moment because we don't have this data yet. So um, under the technical point of view, for sure, CTO PCI is not similar to uh, all comer PCI because there are uh, the stakes are higher, complication rate are higher, success rate are lower, and we need to uh, send this patient to dedicated operators. But as I mentioned before, 99% uh, leisure or 80% leisure or 100% uh, chronic total occlusions uh, uh, give the same symptoms to the patient. So it does not matter to them if they have a 90% leisure or a CTO. So under the clinical point of view, the clinical benefit expected from the procedure is the same. It's just us that have different uh, stakes in the procedure because it's higher risk and more complex. Um, so uh, Melish Thompson asks, if there is no evidence of viability, should attempted CTO be done anyways? Uh, open vessel hypothesis. So I would say that if there is a 100% scar transmurality, uh, like I showed in one of the first studies, um, you know, we should not go for it. If there is complete scar in that territory, probably uh, also the patient will not be symptomatic for angina. Uh, we have to keep in mind that dyspnea and angina are not always caused only by, uh, from, by a, one reason. The patient might be having an obesity problem, might have other sources of, um, of, of dyspnea like heart failure, valve disease. So maybe in these cases, I would be very uh, reluctant to proceed with CTO PCI because really there is a very low likelihood that we're going to provide a benefit. But we've seen that uh, until a 75% LG uh, thickness uh, on the CMR, uh, probably there is good probability of viability uh, as shown with a more sophisticated dobutamine stress-based CMR protocol. That's great. There's also in the chat, um, Dr. Kwan says, excellent talks. Thank you. In your practice, how do you incorporate ischemic eval by nuclear stress like PET uh, in people with minimally symptomatic or you don't bother since symptoms is minimal? Or do you have any strategy to pin down on these minimally symptomatic if you believe? Um, so... <clears throat> If the patient is minimal symptomatic, um, we should, well, the first thing we should do is to maximize medical therapy. So if the patient keeps being symptomatic with two or three antianginal medication, um, you know, in my practice, when I have doubts, I always use these, um, these validated questionnaires because sometimes the patient get to know uh, his or her condition and get to leave coexist with their uh, limitations. So they tell you, oh, everything is fine. But when you dig deeper with a systematic uh, quality of life question, like the SAQ 7 or the Rose Disney scale, you're able to find an objective uh, number that, a uh, semi-objective number that you can pose, um, put in the context of the literature and other studies. So we know that uh, in open, I think the baseline uh, score for SAQ was uh, around 50. So, um, you know, if, if you have a patient with uh, the score 50 out, out of 100 on, uh, on this uh, questionnaire, it's, I wouldn't define the patient minimally symptomatic, despite the fact that they might have learned to coexist with their condition. Because in my experience, after you open this vessel, they tell you, I feel five or 10 years younger. I can do so many things that I just forgot that I was not able to do anymore. And also their uh, partner or friends tell you that, oh, this is a new man, a new woman. They really can do much more than before. So if I have, on the other hand, a complex patient with obesity, heart failure, valvular disease, anemia, some uh, pulmonary fibrosis that also have a CTO, it's really difficult to decide if and how much their symptoms are due to the CTO or not. So in these cases, I try to uh, evaluate them usually with the stress CMR um, or in its absence, especially if the patient was referred from far away with a nuclear stress test or a stress echocardiogram. In these cases, if I see that there is a large ischemic burden, maybe ischemia in 10% or more of the LV mass, I would propose CTOPCI. If the ischemia is like 3%, 
And maybe sometimes it does not even correlate with the region uh, of the myocardium attended by the CTO. I just uh, proposed medical therapy. All right, well, that's great. It looks like we have um, about five minutes uh, in the hour that we can give back to people because I don't see any further uh, questions uh, at this point. Lorenzo, thank you so much. Um, your The depth of your knowledge in this space is, is profound. Uh, it's really helpful uh, that you share that with everyone. So thank you. Um, great job. And uh, for those in attendance, I appreciate um, uh, you being here. So I think with that, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Jamie, and everybody for your attention. Have a good one.